Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Next up is Jeff, who is our software scientist um, who's coordinating a lot of the infrastructure. So please, Jeff. Uh, okay, let me make sure my microphone. Yeah, that's good. Okay, hi, my name is Jeff Wagner. Uh, I am the open force field software scientist, uh, along with part-time Daniel Smith. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit different from the talks we've heard earlier today because this is about software infrastructure. It's less of a science topic. And so uh, for people in the room and people listening on Zoom, you can feel free to jump in at any time with questions or clarifications. This talk is sort of in three parts because I just want to address a couple of the common questions that I anticipate people having. So my goal is to move across an understanding of what it is we're building and what parts of it you need. Uh, during this talk. We're going to start with um, what is this open force field toolkit that we're building and are getting ready to release. So in determining which parts of the open force field stack that you need, uh, we thought it's helpful to separate this out into use cases. So if your use case is that you want to set up simulations using the force fields that we're going to be making, the only component that you need is the open force field toolkit. And this is what we're going to be uh, working with in this afternoon's hands-on session, uh, hands session. If you're interested in performing bef uh, bespoke parameterization for a single molecule that you have on your computer, uh, then you're going to need a component which does not yet exist, but will be called the bespoke workflow. And we're currently in the process, I believe, of getting someone who will be working on that. Uh, if you want to kind of take this to the maximum scope and on your own computing resources, you want to sort of in parallel do all of this force field optimization that we are doing, uh, you're going to need every component in the project. And this is possible, uh, but this is something that you're going to want to contact us and be a little more involved in to understand how the components will work together. I thought it would be good to define some terminology about the open force field toolkit so that we have a common language we can use uh, to talk about what we're delivering. So the Smirnoff specification is a language for defining parameterization strategies. And in the big picture, what we want this to include and what we're kind of building towards is that this is a single place where we record uh, every decision that affects the system energy. And so this isn't just um, maybe bond parameters, but also includes non-bonded um, force cutoffs and things like that. So if you have this file, you can transfer it between machines and get the same system energy for the same molecules. Uh, so this is a general object model. We're going to be talking about things that follow the Smirnoff spec as OFF XML files, because that's what they are right now, open force field XML. But we're not restricted to the XML format. So a single instance of an OFF XML file uses the Smirnoff spec language to describe a particular parameterization strategy. So this will be specific smirks mapping to bond length and force constants and such. Um, this can also include parameter libraries, so things like TIP3P water, where we just want to recognize a molecule and stamp parameters on it. Um, and it's modular. So right now, we're uh, mostly using it for Smirnoff 99 Frost, or um, our initial, yeah, Smirnoff 99 Frost force field. But as we decide to introduce new things like offsite charges, we have keywords that can be used to specify where offsite charges should be put and what kind of parameters they should have. The thing that we're going to be working on this afternoon is the Open Force Field Toolkit. And that's a program that we're going to install on your computer. And it's going to take as input an OFF XML file and a description of a molecular system. And it will output systems ready for simulation. To really jump right into it, this is what it's going to look like inside of your scripts when you interface with the Open Force Field Toolkit. And for people who want a command line interface, it will be easy to add the specific functionality that you want, but this is how it's going to be built on the back end. At the beginning, a force field object will be instantiated by uh, loading a OFF XML file or some equivalent parameter containing object. You'll load a description of your system, and this is going to contain uh, the coordinates of all the atoms. And right now, a lot of people are used to using PDB files, but this does not contain all of the information that we need to apply parameters to your system. So we can guess at the bond orders from a PDB file, but the fields in there, even if it has connect records, have been sort of abused and don't mean what they necessarily should in all cases. So in addition to knowing all of the molecules and atoms and where they are, we need to know detailed information about each unique molecule. 
in the system. And we have different ways that you can specify these unique molecules. So you can give us a mole 2 file, and that contains the bond orders that we need. Or you can even specify it from SMILES. Once we have these unique molecules defined, then we can go ahead and make a topology object. Uh, and this is a toolkit independent topology object. So this is something that we've written. This comes with the open force field toolkit. You don't need open eye. Uh, and this contains uh, a description of the molecular system, as well as uh, detailed information about each unique molecule in that system. And finally, at the end of the day, you can, I'm sorry, you can output the resulting system uh, in OpenMM format. And a lot of people have given us feedback saying, oh, I don't want OpenMM format, and this is okay, because there's this tool Parmed that we can use, uh, at least as a first swing, to uh, generate Amber and Gromax systems uh, that correspond. Uh, can we get a microphone? How about charges? Are you generating them in here, or do they have to be in the PDB file? Good question. Um, there's two ways that we're handling charges. So the initial way that we're handling charges is by specifying a semi-empirical method uh, that will be used to generate charges. And we can show you some more detail about this in the afternoon session, what exact keywords we'll accept. And we're also open to feedback. If you think that there's something that we don't have, um, we can start incorporating that. The second way that charges can be specified is in the future, we'll uh, be able to support those as a sort of parameter library. So sort of like a protein force field where it just pre-specifies um, which charges should be on which atoms for your molecule. So we're working with sort of two different versions of the open force field toolkit. There's the previous version, which is what many of you, if you've used anything, have used. And that's open force field toolkit version 0.1. Um, this is what was used in the previous publication about Smirnoff. So this relies on OpenEye. Uh, so you need to have your system made into OpenEye molecules. Uh, and it uses OpenEye Smirks matching to apply our Smirks based parameters. This is nice because we have these objects where you can open up a parameter. And in Python, you can go and modify uh, the force constant, the bond length, and such. Uh, and you can also just write them uh, in your program. You can add new ones. Uh, these load an old version of the parameter files, and you'll have to keep this in mind when we're transitioning to Smirnoff version 1. And this, by default, outputs OpenMM systems, but again, these can be converted to Amber or Gromax using Parmed. What we're going to be working on uh, this afternoon in the hands-on workshop is, is the preview of the 1.0.0 release. So one of the big new things that we have here is that we've removed the need for OpenEye. We can run everything uh, doing work in the back end using our D kit. And this means that for everything that we used to do using OpenEye, uh, that is assigning partial charges, doing smirk inspection, we've implemented identical functionality or identical to the best that we can, and we're going to be updating it as we find problems. We've uh, implemented that back end using our D kit and Amber tools. Even better, uh, this should be invisible to you as a user. So uh, you're not going to need to have different imports depending on which machine you're working on. Uh, but rather, we automatically check if OpenEye is importable and if the licenses are there. Uh, if they are, the, the script will proceed using that. Otherwise, it will fall back to RDKit and Amber tools. In addition, uh, previously, you had to have OE moles to create your system. And now we have a toolkit independent molecule representation. And so the great thing is, if we find some functionality in, in yet a third uh, Cheminformatics toolkit, we can plug that in as a modular backend. We're, not, we're no longer uh, relying specifically on the properties of any one Cheminformatics toolkit. This quietly handles partial charge calculation. If you have OpenEye, you're going to use QuackPack. If you don't, uh, it's going to go to Amber Tools uh, using Antichamber. Um, but you won't see this. This happens all behind the scenes. Uh, and wherever possible, we're taking the same keywords and, and applying them evenly in the different spaces where they would go uh, in those two toolkits. Also, to keep the road open for people inserting different sorts of parameters that they want to apply to systems in the future, uh, the way that we handle parameters, the way that we handle parameter sections, so bonds and then angles and then um, van der Waals uh, non-bonded um, parameter assignment, these are all completely modular things. We could plug in whole new types of parameters. Uh, and as long as we teach these new parameter handlers, 
uh, how to find where they should apply their parameters and how to add them to our system representation, we're good to go. So this should make it a lot easier for people to independently start making new sorts of parameters and inserting them into systems for simulations. We also have modular parameter IO handlers. So like I said, right now we're using OFF XML. XML isn't necessarily the only choice and we might find it uh, more useful to use a different file format in the future. So that can change. And excitingly, this means that uh, we could have a parameter IO handler where instead of putting in a file that you happen to have on your computer right now, and oh boy, where did I put it? It's in the local directory. Um, we are planning maybe on having just a central place where we put our force fields as we make releases. So you can plug in a URL at that spot uh, and it will go grab the most recent version of the force field. Uh, and again, just to clarify, it's a 1.0.0 prototype that we're going to be using this afternoon. So the ink is still very wet. Uh, not all the functions will be there. Um, but we have a notebook uh, that shows some of the functionality that you can use. Um, I, have a, um, I have a question about the parameter handlers. Does this, uh, um, does this mean that, um, that if we are interested in experimenting with, say, some anharmonic term or some coupling term that... Smirnoff doesn't currently have that we'll be able to define it using this parameter handler and the open force field toolkit will be able to assign it using Smirk's pattern matching and create the and create the corresponding open MM custom force that um, that implements it more or less the answer is yes to that and I think John can more definitively say it, but he's nodding yeah the hope is that without having to modify the toolkit you can create your own parameter handler subclass that knows how to interpret the keywords and create an open MM force. Uh, there, there's difficulty in having it translated into other uh, force fields right now if uh, Parmed doesn't support it, but we can work on ways to turn it into splines or something like that for export. But that's exactly what we want to do. We want to make it very easy for you to try new potential forms or new charge models and just plug them in without ever modifying the toolkit until the point where you're ready to share that and contribute it to the effort. So the developments that are in progress that we'll be looking at uh, uh, um, in the API but won't necessarily be able to use this afternoon is, like I was saying, additional flexibility and partial charge calculations. So maybe we want to use multiple confirmers um, and get some sort of average of their partial charges when we're doing semi-empirical. Uh, and those are keywords that we're going to be adding in the future. Uh, and if you have any feedback on what keywords would be particularly useful, we can compare that to uh, the plans we have for the API. Both the Smirnoff spec and the um, aromaticity model may change in the future. We found certain limitations for our aromaticity model, but they are consistent across all the molecules we look at, so parameters will be applied in the way that they're fit. Um, but if we end up fixing this, we're going to need to be checking for compatibility, uh, so we'll, we'll be able to load an OFF XML and see uh, what sort of aromaticity model do we expect when we're applying these parameters to a system? Like I said, application of library charges is slated for the future. Uh, Viberg bond order calculation. And this is uh, going to be important for different sorts of parameterization strategies. So as we apply off-center charges, um, custom bond charge corrections, and also valence parameter interpolation. So if we have a bond order of 1.5, is it reasonable to go take the bond order one and the bond order two parameter uh, and just average them or use some sort of function uh, to get a interpolated parameter. Uh, yes, Chris. So uh, just, uh, it, what if somebody's uh, really fussy about their charges and they want to import charges that go on their molecule? Uh, I'm seeing you can calculate them internally or you can have them in a library. Is there gonna be a means to import charges or a molecule that has charges? This is a great question, and this is something that I wrote a bit about um, in the notebook that we'll be using for the afternoon session. And the answer is yes, you can bring in your own charges, but you'll want to tread carefully because the, um, the parameters that are going to be fit to these molecules were fit using the semi-empirical method listed in the OFF XML. Uh, and so it's possible that if you bring in your own charges, they will sort of be out of spec with how the bonds were parameterized or how the torsions were parameterized. <laughs> Uh, and in the future, we're also looking at, uh, in the long run, maybe including support for biopolymers, so being able to put in your protein as well as your small molecules. 
Another thing that's a recent development is sort of a very large overhaul of the documentation led by John and David. Uh, so this is the um, version 0.1 documentation. We have a, a few subcategories here for looking up information about what we do and how we do it. And now here's a version 1.0.0 draft documentation. Uh, this is getting near a pretty final form and you'll be able to look at a preview of it in this afternoon's hands-on session. But it has uh, much more detailed information and you'll be able to dig down. Um, we have human written comments and discussion about how we do things, but also we have uh, APIs for every, every callable function in the entire thing. So you can really do a lot of your own hacking. A quick note about versioning, these numbers aren't all made up. They actually have a specific meaning. Um, so the initial Smirnoff publication was done using uh, version 0 0.1.0 of the Open Force Field Toolkit and version 0 0.1 of the spec. Today, we're making toolkit uh, version 1.0.0 and version 1.0 of the Smirnoff spec. And so again, the spec is the language that we use to describe a parameterization strategy. Uh, and in case we find that we need completely new keywords that we hadn't anticipated, we're going to increase the version number of the spec. Uh, the meaning of these numbers is that the first uh, decimal play, or the first digit indicates um, major API changing updates. So if we change from Smirnoff version 1 point something to Smirnoff version 2 point something, that means that your previous scripts may not necessarily work when calling the API. We could have changed stuff's name, the entire science could have changed to the point that your old stuff uh, needs to be updated. If the second digit change changes, that means that we've added new features. Your old scripts will still work, but um, there are some new calls that can be made from the toolkit. Uh, and Z is going to increment with bug fixes. And so as you submit uh, issues that you've run into, um, that Z number will be incrementing uh, probably the fastest of all. So I'd like to stop there and ask if anyone has questions about the toolkit as a whole. Um, and I might just direct you to the hands-on session this afternoon, but I can take questions about that right now. Oh, yeah. Just a question on when you're reading in MOL2 files, because I've always found that atom typing in MOL2 files is not well defined. Are you paying any attention to that, or are you just using that to get the element type that you then use when you do the matching? Uh, at this point, I believe we're only using the element type. Okay. Uh, oh, is that not correct, John? Why don't you go? Maybe I can elaborate a bit more. And th this is something we'd love your feedback on. How do you want to get your molecules into the toolkit in the first place? Do you want to use MOL2s or SDFs? So th what happens right now, I believe, is that we load in uh, the molecules into a, um, or create from smiles into some, one of the toolkits that you have installed. So it's either the RD kit or OpenEye or anything else we add in the future. And then that is, we know how to translate that back into our molecule spec, where we have sort of a universal representation that can convert between toolkits. Um, so we do need to make sure that, because we use the uh, aromaticity perception and the uh, smart typing for the individual toolkit under the hood, um, that that interpretation is done correctly. And there's huge problems with RDKit reading MOL2 files because okay. it only supports, is it Karina uh, and not typing. Sybil uh, typing? Um, and it, there's no capability for writing MOL2 files as well. So, Pat and I had a great conversation, brief conversation about this at dinner last night. And we kind of concluded that one really good path forward because for reasons he kind of just alluded to, he doesn't like MOL2 either, <clears throat> is that we get support into RD kit for uh, SDFs with a well-specified charge tag. So that, so in other words, work with RD kit to find a standard partial charge carrying tag. And then we can use SDF for basically everything we want. And that if effectively would become a new SDF standard that has everything we want. All right. So these would be SD tags then for, yeah. Okay. But, but then that would become sort of a standard partial charge SD tag for everybody. And then we, can use that as a universal container. Or, <laughs> or out of microphones. <laughs> or you guys have made an internal representation of a molecule with your own specifications, and what you need is a format specification just for reading and writing. Well, well, Pat, they're going to take an SDF and create a standard set of SD tags for charges. Well, I don't think so. I don't want to create more time. We have enough. Cage match. Cage okay. match. <laughs> okay. But but, but I this, if, if we just work with RD kit to get this in, it's a it would be a simple 
thing that almost everybody can use, you know, right away and then it'll probably spread from there. So it's an easy thing to do without creating a new format. I think the key concept for us is that we, we have an, an object model which says, here's what a molecule is, here's the minimal information we need about possibly charges and uh, atom identities and uh, stereochemistry and bond orders. And that's enough information to go back and forth between all the other toolkits. So we do have a way of serializing that to disk if you wanted to use that directly in any of 10 formats uh, that you might enjoy using. But that object model is sort of the only information we need. And any way you can populate it, we can just make it convenient to do that through multiple ways. Right. I, I think that the biggest problem I have is I want to avoid file formats that make assumptions. And while two format makes assumptions, and none of those assumptions are documented anywhere that I know of. <laughs> oh yeah, so the question was which file formats do we currently support? Uh, and the answer is from OpenEye, uh, we support MOL2 and Smiles. From RDKit, we support SDF and Smiles, and we're being very conservative right now, so we don't we don't want to leave the gates wide open for anything these toolkits can read because they have different behaviors when they read. Um, so basically right now we're only taking well-trodden routes and as interest comes up from you all, um, we can start working to make sure that we know the limitations of uh, these toolkits reading different file formats, but we can bring them into our neutral format that we use for parameterization. Uh, what sort of idiot proofing is there gonna be? Because I went through uh, a couple of weeks a while back, admittedly, when I had some osmium parameters applied to oxygens, just because I'm an idiot, right? And my <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Right, you know, but um, I don't know. I'm surely there will be some people who also do things like this, right? And our, the, the philosophy that I've been sort of guiding myself by here is that er error should be fatal. Um, so like our dkit is, is very helpful. It can load big databases um, and, and maybe in these big databases some molecules that won't interpret correctly and it does that silently and that's a very scary thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so wherever possible, uh, you'll find maybe when you try to import your own molecules that we're very strict about stereochemistry. Um, we really need very complete definitions and uh, wherever possible we're, we're having it throw an error. It's, it's going to be fatal uh, to the program if a molecule attempts to be imported uh, that is ambiguous in any way. All right, uh, so with that, I guess I'll move on to part two. And that's gonna talk about uh, the different software components uh, beyond just the open force field toolkit and how we're gonna go about developing them in this consortium. So the number one biggest thing that we think about is deployment. Um, it's great if we make software, but uh, frequently the case with scientific software is it runs great on my computer, but it doesn't run on yours. Uh, so I wanted to open up uh, for industry partners by explaining how you'll get the software. Uh, there are popular distribution tools that leverage internet access to these big managed libraries, uh, and it's great if you can access that, but the results of our survey indicate that perhaps not all of you will have access to that. Uh, and so our number one plan for reliability is that we will send out um, large binary installers for Mac and Linux. Uh, so these, we can send them to you on a USB key or by different file transfers, but these are things uh, that across the industry are used with very high reliability. This is, uh, so the question was, is, it, is this in, di in addition to Conda Forge or instead of Conda Forge, this is in addition to. So we'll still have conventional cloud-based distribution where things magically appear on your computer, but we'll also have a way to get into more secure environments. Um, these binary installers will not require administrator access to install. These are a local build of Python. Uh, they can live in your home directory or whatever data directories you can access. Um, they will include all of the dependencies that you need to run. Uh, they'll be built using uh, this platform called Conda using Python 3.6 and 3.7. Uh, and I, I wanna drive home that, that even though this has really amazing cloud capabilities, Conda is a reliable tool that's used in a lot of industries as a standard. Um, so this is something that we really do expect will run um, but we'll still walk you through the installation one-on-one uh, -on -one to ensure that it gets on your computing infrastructure. Uh, unfortunately, the, the ink is still wet sort of on the scientific capabilities of the code that we're showing this afternoon. So we can't give you uh, this large binary installer today. We'll be using the cloud-based solution. 
Um, but it's, it's one of the highest issues on our to-do list. And we have um, an expert, Daniel Smith, who's implemented this for one of his other projects, uh, who's working with us on making this installer. Daniel Smith runs a project called Sci4. And uh, on the website, this is the way that he interface, or this is the way that users will interface with uh, getting the newest version of the toolkit. Uh, so the Sci4 installer you see on this first line, you select your operating system, and here it supports uh, Linux, Mac operating system, or the Windows subsystem for Linux. You have your choice of getting the binary installer, um, the Conda installer, or uh, installation from source. I'm sure we're all very familiar with that. Uh, and then a selection of Python versions. For us, this will only be 3.6 and 3.7. And then uh, if this small thing on the bottom will disappear, you'll have the choice of a stable release where we guarantee that all of the toolkits are intercompatible, uh, or if there's some new functionality that you desperately need and you don't have time to wait for a stable bug fix, you can get our nightly builds. Uh, yes, and to Chris Bailey's point, uh, conventional Conda installation from Conda Forge will be supported. So you can, um, if you do not have access restrictions, you'll just be able to run this Conda install command uh, and an environment will come down onto your computer. We will be moving. Uh, so currently the project lives on a Conda channel called the Omnia. Um, these channels can mean a lot of things, but in this case, it's sort of uh, things within a single channel uh, you can assume that they sort of have similar dependencies, so similar system level um, libraries. And every once in a while, you install things with incompatible dependencies, and it's a big problem. And that's one purpose of Conda channels. Uh, so as computing standards change, or as operating systems put in new features, and you have to specify stuff when you install in different ways, um, these packages have to be changed. Uh, and this can be a problem when the developer goes away or the grad student graduates. Uh, a package will fall out of maintenance and no longer be installable. So right now, Omnia has uh, a community of developers who maintain the packages that are there. Um, but the maintenance burden is becoming substantial. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the fixes that need to be made based on these new architectures or whatnot that come out um, can be made by bots or by just like a small team of professional developers. And that's what Conda Forge offers. So it has uh, an active community, community of professional maintainers who will help watch your build system. And as things change or as your standards change, they will go and suggest changes um, to the open force field consortium when we're on there saying, hey, you'll need to update this to maintain compatibility. So one way to think about this, uh, as Daniel Smith explained it, was that every developer in open force field could get hit by a bus and you'd, you'd be able to continue installing the software for an estimated five years or so before it fell out of compatibility. <laughs> what about the bus? <laughs> the way that you'll see how to use the project components in open force field uh, is using a service called read the docs. And so here I have an example uh, of the open force field toolkit. And on the left, this is the source code. So this is the actual Python code. And when I define a function, I'm putting in uh, these keywords in the doc string for the function. And read the docs goes ahead and parses my code and it finds these and turns them into formatted web documentation. So we're going to be uh, implementing read the docs for all the projects in this consor uh, consortium so that if you just wanna use the toolkit, then you can come look at the toolkit documentation. But if in the future you wanna get more hands-on, uh, you'll be able to see the ways that you can interface with all of these packages. Another problem is that we're gonna have so much separate development going on uh, that we won't know if one package breaks, in what way did it break? Uh, if packages rely on each other and one changes its behavior, how do we manage that? Uh, and so we're gonna be running two types of tests. So what I'm showing on the right here, this is uh, as of a couple days ago, uh, the Travis status for all of the projects that are going on. And as developers in open force field commit changes to GitHub, Travis will see those changes and go ahead and try to compile all the code and run all the tests that are in there and uh, we get a green check mark if all the tests pass, and we get these uh, different degrees of redness uh, if the tests fail. And this is one way to check. Because this, because this Travis system makes everything from the ground up, including all the uh, dependencies, this is one way that we can check that the software is still remaining intercompatible. So each package will run with two types of tests. So there's regression tests, 
where uh, I'm a developer, I'm making changes to my software, and I'm making sure that these changes to my software work with the previous stable releases of all the dependencies, all the other project components in Open Force Field. But to make sure that all the development versions work together so that at some point we can release whole new um, stable, like sets of stable versions for the entire consortium, we have these integration tests. And these are with the bleeding edge of each one of the components. Uh, and only when these integration tests pass will we say, okay, now we can cut a stable release of the new bespoke fitting workflow without sending industry something that just breaks when you try to uh, run it for the first time. Uh, open force field is open. And this means that we get a lot of benefits from the community. Uh, so we'll have people submitting bug reports to us from outside of uh, the people in this room and on this web call, people submitting fixes to those bug reports, and we really gain a lot. But on the other hand, uh, we do have to watch out for the emergence of negative behavior. Uh, so for example, this is a quote from the maker of Linux. Uh, and the Linux community has recently gone through a lot of trouble because uh, they just had a bad culture. People didn't want to contribute to Linux because the head developer, Linus Torvalds, would send very mean things to people uh, and developers wouldn't want to volunteer their time. And there's different ways that this sort of culture can emerge, um, but it's something that's inevitable. Uh, and so one thing that we're going to be putting into place is a formal code of conduct. So what we expect when people contribute, and I think for the people who are formally uh, involved in the consortium in this room, this won't be a problem at all. Um, but as a public begins interfacing, and I think we're going to be getting a lot of attention, I hope, uh, this will lay down standards for how people should be interacting with each other, and hopefully getting us the good parts of being open source. To make sure that we have these best practices, that we have build the, um, that we have these integration tests running for every component, that we have documentation building for every component. Uh, we don't want to go to every component maker separately and say, hey, we're going to sit down for a week and give you all of this uh, and implement it sort of differently on each one of your um, projects. And one great thing is that we're working with this organization called MULSI, who want to improve the quality of scientific software uh, in all sorts of different areas. And one thing that they provide is called the MULSI Project Cookie Cutter. And this is a way to download sort of a very generic repository that can contain all sorts of different code, but it already has a files needed to spin up read the docs and Travis. Uh, and it's just registered, like there's a couple steps to register uh, your project with um, these different external services. But for the most part, the work is done. And these are systems that the software scientists at MOLSI know how to interface with. So if a developer leaves or if they have a problem that they don't, have to, that they don't know how to solve, um, these are systems that the software scientists will be experts on and can help uh, keep these packages up to spec. Um, kind of a, a closed invitation, um, but on Wednesday, so tomorrow, uh, open force field developers are actually having uh, a long workshop talking about uh, the state of each one of the components in the project and how we can get it up to uh, the standards that we want to have, making sure that all of these components fit together and make a useful working product. Does anyone have any questions about the software standards that we will be applying across the different components in the consortium? If not, I'll go ahead and continue on to the last portion which is how will these components interact? And this I interpret to have two meanings. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, to get the understanding of this across to you as best I can. So on one hand, these components will talk to each other. They'll have, have a calls in Python or calls on the command line that can be made. And we need to make sure that each component knows about the other components call um, interfaces well enough to use them in a reliably and scientifically correct way. But then beyond that, a lot of the components of this project will be operating over distributed computing. So clusters here in San Diego and in Colorado and in New York. Um, and what exactly does the interface to that look like? How are we going to be developing software that can be distributed um, and called using these uh, sort of archive management systems or distributed computing management systems? So this is one of the most overwhelming problems that I ran into while I was trying to figure out uh, who needs to be talking to who to put together these components? So we had shown the conceptual scientific um, in what order will we run things, what, what big issue, uh, what big picture topics will communicate with what other big picture topics. 
but as a software scientist, I want to look at this as which programs are going to talk to which other programs to make sure that the developers can all sit down for some time and agree on um, what sort of returns, uh, what sort of return values our components will have. So if your component fails, will I get a matrix of all zeros? Will I get false? Will it throw an error? Because this is important to having a workflow that knows how to run for more than a few cycles. And our solution is that we're going to put a lot of reliance on stable defined APIs. And so initially we're gonna have the developers sit down and talk scientifically about what are the important concepts to get across between these components. Um, and once we have that down and documented, it will allow future developers or developers outside of the immediate uh, room here to go ahead and use our tools for uh, whatever purpose they want because we'll have the behavior very well documented. That said, even if the functions in front do the same things, performance improvements and changes in how the science is done, uh, you know, in terms of becoming more accurate can happen on the back end. So we just have to define sort of what public interface we're gonna uh, allow, maybe only expand that, try not to change the existing behavior too much, uh, and development work can go on uh, involving the community. Read the docs is nice in that uh, it, Auto generates, you know, stuff from the doc strings in your code saying this function returns an integer or a list of integers, but also that it gives developers room for a little bit of scientific discussion. So we can talk about, oh, if you pass me weird ionization state of lithium, the function might do this, or topics like that. So other developers who are plugging in can get the full meaning um, of what the functions do. GitHub is a great way to um, find bugs and track them and invite discussion about them. And especially with this kind of project, these bugs can get tricky because sometimes they're technical, um, but sometimes they're scientific and require making a decision. Uh, and GitHub is a really good way to record these design decisions uh, and, and the reasons that we came to them. And as I said before, uh, these APIs will be great. And in conjunction with uh, regression and integ integration testing, this will actually give us a fairly streamlined way to make sure that all of these components come together into one working product at the end of the day. So our distributed computing for this project, on one hand, uh, we have the quantum chemistry distributed computing project. And this is a, a somewhat mature product that's being developed by Daniel Smith. Um, and the way that the QC fractal distributed uh, computing uh, program takes input is that it takes these sort of formatted files. And so in this case, this is an energy calculation for water, and it has these very rigorously defined fields. Uh, it says, okay, molecule, I need to have the coordinates of these three atoms. These atoms are oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen. I'm interested in getting energy out. Um, and, and a couple different keywords here. And this is eaten by the QC fractal machine, which goes and figures out uh, what computer somewhere can go run this job with what backend, uh, and it will go farm the job out. And to the user, what happens is a few minutes later, they get this return output. And basically, the important things to see here is that uh, the run did not fail. The return result was uh, a number of interest, energy, and some units, I assume. Um, and also that the versions of programs that were used here are recorded. So this is, uh, again, something that really exists. You could go do this right now with QC Fractal. This is the starting point for how we want to do distributed computing for things like our property calculator. So for that, we envision input jobs looking something like um, the function that we want to run is called property.density. We want to run this on a substance. Uh, so maybe we have some record from thermoML describing a mixture of substances or a pure substance and something about it. So in this case, our substance is ethanol. Uh, the mole fraction of our system is one uh, for the ethanol. And if we had multiple components, they would add up to one. Uh, the impurity flag is false. And then here we can say, what, what keywords do we want that will affect the computation of this property? So we might say, all right, here's the force field. And we could just put the whole force field file here. We could put the whole object representation force field right in this uh, input file. Uh, we'll say, you know, here we didn't define coordinates or anything or a number of particles, so we could say, oh, you go use PacMol using some pre-known settings for how to put together these sorts of systems for that. And we can have a workflow defined on the worker that receives this job to know how to do that in a reproducible way. 
Uh, we can have information about the thermodynamic state. So these are going to be inputs to the molecular dynamics program. Uh, and then also uh, one thing, and this is sort of getting into the weeds, but for the property calculator, uh, the longer we simulate, uh, the lower the uncertainty will be uh, as we have more data about these properties that we're observing. Uh, and so we can say, well, here's the experimental data that we have uh, with some amount of uncertainty. Go ahead and use some predefined rules to run this molecular dynamic simulation until the uncertainty of that simulation is kind of on par with the uncertainty of the measurement so we know they're comparable. And at the end of the day, we want to get this return result uh, that has maybe, uh, what we're we looking at, the density in some units uh, and the uncertainty on that density. density. And also, because molecular dynamics can be a very complicated, multi-component thing, we want information about uh, the version numbers, the toolkit numbers, and everything of all the components that were used to construct that system and perform that calculation. Uh, and so I don't think it's unreasonable to have these very large provenance sections. And that way, if in the future we go and we say, oh, oh gosh, it seems like our D-kit was getting aromaticity wrong in some cases, or it was differing from open or the way that we did it, we can go ahead and track down that data and remove it um, while, without having to throw out all of our previous work. Is there a question? Are you yes. going to include like property? You can repeat. Are you going to include property and unit data in the output? Uh, yes. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say number one, this is an approximate representation. We have a draft representation that's very immature, so we don't want to share it. Um, but actually, the the um, the example that I drew from is many pages long of things, uh, including yeah, values and quantities of those values in different in um, completely described unit systems. So good question. Was there another question, or did that address it? Okay. Uh, and, and again, this is an immature topic. I, I believe this is um, Simon's arena. And so in the coming months, he'll have more to say about this. Um, but this is just an example to show how distributed computing can work. So on one hand, the property calculator is something that will obviously be distributed. It's one of the main goals of the consortium. But I wanted to walk through the steps that enable any component in this project to operate in a distributed manner through QC Fractal. So if we can define in Python, a function that creates some output, it's got a name like my function, and uh, input A and input B. If input A and input B and output can go through this process called serialization, uh, and my function can be installed using Conda, then we can run this through QC Fractal. And this can be a very arbitrary function. And the things that we have to do is we have to standardize the description. So this means we have to have the function do something um, that is reproducible uh, and that is unambiguously named and formatted with the input so that, you know, we have to sit here and think of all the keywords that people might want to use when we describe a task. But once we have that, uh, we can put it into these schemas where it will be an unambiguous way to send task, uh, task descriptions between machines asking for computation to happen. In the case of this uh, property calculator run, there needs to be infrastructure on the worker nodes that instead of returning the whole trajectory, because we don't have the bandwidth to do that for all the computation that we're going to do, it needs to parse through the output of whatever did the simulation uh, and return only the needed quantities, so the single uh, value output that we're interested in. And we, we want to think ahead of time, like I said, about the customization options so that we can have keywords prepared in these task descriptions um, for the different ways that we might want to do the calculations. We also need to make sure that all of the objects can be serialized. So input A and input B could be things as simple as strings, or they could be things as complicated as entire defined topologies, depending on what we're sending between machines and what work needs to be done. And serialization is something that a lot of Python packages support, um, but you have to design your objects uh, with serialization in mind ahead of time. But it's a way to take a living object in like a Python session and turn it into an unambiguous representation, could be a string, could be a file that can be sent somewhere else. Uh, people who are used to pickle, pickle is something like serialization, but it's not always safe. Not all objects know how to pickle safely because some of them have links to other objects and it gets complicated. So serialization is a way to take just one object and unambiguously put that into a file that can be reinflated somewhere else. If we use serialization, uh, the interfaces between our components will be a lot more reliable. We won't uh, you know, necessarily depend on toolkit descriptions of molecules or anything uh, to go between components. 
uh, we'll have a very well-defined way to pass information between components. Further, for these worker nodes to work, we need to have all the components be able to install no questions asked on any cluster involved in the consortium or any cluster where we have compute time. Uh, and this is one really great thing that comes with Conda deployment. Lots of machines can access the Conda cloud. Um, it's, it's fairly easy to update. And so for each maintainer at the different uh, centers in this project, uh, when, when the time comes to do an update, we just all update and suddenly all of the workers in this open force field cloud know how to do the new tasks that we have or have the bug fixes that we need. And finally, uh, I don't think that there's any, any amount of provenance cracking that's too far. Keeping track of all the version numbers uh, of everything that was used will let us be able to backtrack and remove bad data from our database uh, without having to throw everything away, away if we find a problem. I use this term open force field cloud. And so one way to look at this is that um, if open force field had a billion dollars or like the entire Amazon cloud, we could go ahead and spin up all the machines that we want that look completely identical, do completely identical things, um, but we're not in that situation. We're in a situation where we have compute time from different centers, um, very different architectures of machines, and we need a way to get the same results from each of those machines and distribute the compute. And so this is something that's handled by QC Fractal, uh, and we can distribute new uh, versions of software and new task descriptions to all of these computers. But uh, wherever QC Fractal uh, has open force field managers and workers running are places that can receive tasks in the open force field group. And these tasks could be property calculations, they could be quantum mechanical calculations. Uh, the, each place that has these managers and workers running uh, will need to have one person designated as a maintainer. And that way we can say it's Saturday or it's Monday, um, we've pushed a bug fix or something like that. Could you please go run Conda update on your workers? Uh, if you're interested in computing, uh, or if you're interested in contributing your excess computing time on your clusters, uh, as the project grows in scope, we're going to be using basically everything we can get. So go ahead and contact me or Daniel Smith uh, if you're interested in contributing that. Uh, the property calculator specifically because of the needs of reweighting. Uh, so this is something where we take a trajectory that was previously com computed. We've only made a small change in the parameters. We think, oh, can we get the new density out without redoing the entire simulation? In some cases, if the trajectory is available, we can do that, but we need to make sure that that job is sent to the supercomputer that already did um, the initial trajectory so that it can be reweighted. And that's gonna be an advanced functionality, and for that reason, the property calculator uh, in the big picture will initially be deployed on one cluster where all the previous trajectories uh, will be stored locally, and in the future, we'll, we'll figure out a way to um, distribute jobs knowing where previous trajectories were run. So with that sort of scattered talk, I wanted to end with a description of um, who I am and, and what I will be doing here. So my name is Jeff Wagner, uh, and I am an open force field software scientist. Uh, my job description has been getting fleshed out, but the things that you can expect me to do and the things that you should contact me uh, when you have a problem with are, uh, or my primary responsibilities are bringing project components up to our software standards, like I just described. Uh, maintaining the core software toolkits, so I'm the Smirnoff guy. If you have problems with Smirnoff, uh, they are primarily my problems. Uh, well, I'll be guiding the development of APIs to ensure functionality, so these are gonna be the outward-facing interfaces from each of the components. We need them to operate in a sort of interdependent way, but also these are independent scientific components, so we need to de design APIs that accomplish both of those goals. Uh, I will be managing these nightly builds, uh, making sure that component interoperability is being continuously tested and we know when it's safe to release a new build of the whole toolkit. Uh, I'll be helping include new functionality, so if groups join later or if, if entirely new projects need to be spun up, I can help decide how that will be added to the big picture. Uh, and I think for a lot of people in this room, this is important. Uh, when you have problems with this running on your computer, I'm the person to talk to. Uh, and right now we're still drying the ink on the code that's written, but if problems come up uh, during the mature phase of this project, you should come talk to me. Uh, and, and this is something that might even be affecting other people, so don't be shy. Um, for technical problems, I think it's most helpful if you uh, contact me on GitHub, because that way we can keep a kind of a running log of what we've tried to fix these problems and, and what fix ended up doing it so that other people in the future can find it. 
Um, this is sort of a tricky role for me because I, I am a PhD scientist, but I, I don't know that much about quantum. I don't know all the deep details about every different area here. And so if your problem is more of a scientific nature, please feel free to contact me on the open force field Slack in a channel that you think is appropriate. And that way we can bring in the scientists who are developing uh, the tools to also have input to make sure that we address your question efficiently. Uh, this is something I said in October, and I actually sort of mean it more now, is that with each uh, pharma partner that's working on this project, I wanna make sure that we have a one-on-one -on -one to talk about if we're able to kind of deploy on your systems or what special arrangement we need to have to make sure that we can push you updates and get you the latest and greatest from our consortium. So with that said, uh, I think this was maybe a relatively short talk, so I'd love your feedback. Um, and we can continue discussions on the infrastructure channel on Slack. That's where you'll find me. Are there any questions? Yes, Chris. Uh, backing up a couple of slides, you were talking about when you come up with updates, you'll push them out to the um, QC Fractal servers and then they will modify their environments. But I'm just <clears throat> wondering whether you could, there could be some danger of some of the environments becoming uh, heterogeneous at this point. And something that we've done internally at OpenAI is we will use Conda environments. So we'll, so when we, instead of pushing in an individual update, we'll just have make sure our, our servers are running with us the same Conda environment and have the, so we'll update a whole environment. And that way we can know that everything's staying in sync. So are you, when you, are you thinking of pushing like, you know, yes. install update? No. <laughs> No, we're planning, on, we're planning on updating entire Conda environments, and that's, that's sort of the plan A. If, if Daniel Smith wants to jump in with any details on that, he can, but I think that's basically what we're going to do is use Conda to, to push synchronized updates of all component, or all stable releases of components uh, as needed. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, we can talk a lot more about how... Um, we're pinning different environment versions and to making sure that the entire stack uh, is up to date whenever we're doing these kind of cloud-based computings. Um, at the same time, um, it'd actually be really great to uh, talk to your engineers to make sure that um, we're not reinventing any new ideas there as well. Yes, and especially, um, you know, this is, this is one of those things that, that we anticipate we will have well covered. Um, by managing these Conda environments and, and synchronizing updates of all components. Uh, but this is also something that will be caught by re recording a ridiculous amount of provenance information. So if we find that one of our toolkits was running with an old version that didn't have the, the capabilities that we needed at a certain time, we can remove that from the fitting data set. If that's all, uh, I'll put in one plug for the hands-on session this afternoon. Um, the hands-on session, uh, when these slides get distributed, it'll actually just be, uh, the instructions are on this uh, penultimate slide in my presentation. And this is what we'll be doing to, if you have a Linux or a uh, Mac laptop, get you this prototype version of the 1.0.0 toolkit and run you through a couple examples of what it can do. Um, so when we distribute the slides for this talk, uh, the instructions for the hands-on session will be at the end of that. And because we're all on the same Wi-Fi here for the folks in this room, you may want to start running these download steps if you don't have Conda or if you don't have, uh, you might want to start putting in this, the like type these into the command line commands, maybe during lunch so that we don't overwhelm the Wi-Fi and that we can get all the components for the, the hands-on. Yeah, let's get you a mic. I have OpenMM already installed. Do I still need to run the whole Omnia thing? In? Um, you will, if you have OpenMM installed, I would encourage you to get the most recent version because that's what we've tested against. Um, so yeah, I would still run this command and create a whole new environment using all the, the current versions of the packages. Uh, yeah, Sinjin. So if 
if I do not have open ME, so, and also, or if I want to share some of the parameter, just to ask other colleagues in Pfizer to test it, is there other way for them to, other than using open ME, because we don't commonly use and have an external interface to other software package? So our external interface is largely the fact that we can output parameterized systems. Um, so using our toolkit, you can create the system, and then at the end, uh, you can have an OpenMM system file, or Amber system files, or Gromax system files. And during the hands-on session, I'll show you the functionality that we'll have um, to create those files. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, some so kind of, because uh, most practitioners do not use Amber or Charm directly, so that may be another, uh, we're talking to a few colleagues, maybe is that, whether you may find out an interval, generate a virtual file for micro model or mode type of software so that it's easy to test. This is something we could talk about at the one-on-ones. I think John wants to say something. Yeah, this, this is super important to get information from you on how, how you're going to integrate the toolkit use into your workflows. And if you need parameters in a certain format or if it would be convenient to have something that would stand in for some other thing, then we can look into uh, figuring out exactly how to do that. Um, we already, go ahead, David. I was just also going to point out, there's, there's an important distinction between a parameterized system and the parameters themselves. But because we're using this, so it's going to be much easier to move parameterized systems around than to move the parameters themselves around because we are using this direct chemical perception, which is different from most of what the other modeling packages do. So you can't move our force field as a whole force field into many of these other packages, you have to move just the parameterized systems. And sometimes the parameters are not, or the input file formats are not super well documented, so it's useful for us to put us in touch with your tool makers as well. Yeah, so, so I, I, I do realize that because the chemical perception, but if you look at uh, Clark Steel's micro model format, file format, there's a subsection of that is very similar to the, the SMUG format that you could potentially uh, go through just like passing through all the general parameter and define the specific one for the uh, chemical structure that can be used. So there's a session that have a special definition. That can... Okay, if there are no other questions, I think maybe I'll just wrap up with a little bit of time remaining. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>